Well, I hope this class continues to bless you. I've, I've heard uh, from two different people this week that have encountered uh, situations where uh, this knowledge has benefited them. For one, I heard from uh, actually from Stan Burnett's Sunday morning class where they came across a passage in Luke that had a variant in it that, that um, kind of related to one of some of the topics we've talked about possibly. And then I had one of our brothers call me asking why a verse was missing uh, from a chapter we haven't investigated yet. And we, we discussed the, the manuscript issue and the footnote that was provided related to that text. And it's just been a, a joy to, to hear individuals uh, at least benefiting from this study and, and noticing things in Scripture that they might not otherwise have noticed before. And that's the goal. Our goal is to understand why Scripture has to make uh, uh, footnotes, why certain texts are bracketed, things like that. Uh, so that we can understand Scripture better and have confidence in it and be able to defend it all at the same time. So tonight we continue our study of how we got the Bible, and this is the order of the study that I, I put forth at the beginning of this series, where we're going to focus on the inspiration with our first week, and then we've been, for the past five or six weeks, been focused on the transmission of how God's Word has been preserved and passed down through the centuries. And Next week, we are going to start talking about the collection of God's Word. Next week, we're going to start talking about how the New Testament books became a New Testament canon, how they became selected for admission into what we now call as the New Testament. Uh, but tonight, we're going to conclude our discussion about the transmission. And if you recall from last week, we were focused on textual variants. In fact, for the past three or four weeks, we've been focused on textual variants. We spent a lot of time on the um, uh, unintentional variants that appear in Scripture and why they appear. And then last week, we introduced some intentional variants and why they appear. And then we concluded last week by talking about some of the most notable variants that appear in the New Testament. We covered two of those last week, and as way of review, I want to mention those two passages just so you uh, uh, recall what they are, or if you're un in tuning in with us for the first time tonight, you uh, will know why number one and number two are up there. The first one we looked at comes from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. It's a passage that uh, is included in the model prayer but you'll only find it in the King James Version and the New King James Version as far as in the text at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. Otherwise, you'll find it typically in the footnotes. And uh, it's a phrase that says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the uh, most uh, trusted manuscripts of the New Testament, that phrase does not appear. In the most valuable and most trusted New Testament manuscripts, which are typically the oldest and typically associated with, if you remember this terminology, the Alexandrian text type, that textual family of manuscripts that are, are typically uh, associated with the oldest manuscripts that we possess. And this phrase does not appear in the oldest manuscripts or the best manuscripts, and therefore is not likely um, original to the text. M most likely what happened is this terminology was utilized by the church when they recited the model prayer because it provided a more proper closing. And then over time, as scribes were editing the text of, of, of manuscripts, uh, this may have been memorized by some of them and they felt like it was accidentally left out or, or maybe it was in a marginal note, which we'll talk more about in, in a minute. Um, but but for, some, for whatever reason, eventually along the way, that phrase got added into the text, even though it most likely was not part of the original. Then we looked at Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, which is one of the, the more famous uh, variants in the New Testament. It's called the long ending of Mark as opposed to the short ending, because the best manuscripts of the New Testament end Mark at verse 8 in chapter 16. But there are several manuscripts that include verses 9 through 20, which includes uh, one rendition of the Great Commission. And the evidence seems to be opposed to the inclusion of verses 9 through 20 at Mark chapter 16 because so many valuable manuscripts do not possess it. And uh, we, we noted that even if this section should not be included, it's not a, a, um, a loss of any doctrine for us because even though there's a great passage about baptism in verse 16, 
we still have the teaching of and the doctrine of baptism present throughout the rest of the New Testament. So we looked at these two passages. Both of them uh, show evidence of a variant that probably was not original to the New Testament text. Now we're going to continue on with four more notable variants that are, that are worth our attention and time this evening. The first of these last four appears in John chapter 5 and verse 4. Actually, verse 3 and verse 4. So if you'll turn over to John chapter 5, this is the story, the narrative story of Jesus healing the lame man near the pool. You may recall this story because there's an interesting tidbit about how the first person in the pool would receive healing when the waters were stirred. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 of John chapter 5, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Now if you're not reading from the New King James Version, or from the King James Version for that matter, you likely didn't see the words from the second half of verse 3 and all of verse 4. In fact, you'll notice in your text that if you're using the New American Standard Version, um, it does, in the 1995 update and prior, includes the end of verse 3 as well as all of verse 4, but places brackets around it. And provides a footnote that says early manuscripts do not contain the remainder of verse 3 nor verse 4. The updated New American Standard Version, which is a fairly recent update, provides a, a footnote at John chapter 5 and verse 3, which says essentially the same thing, but it's no longer in the text of the New American Standard Version. The New International Version provides the number 4, identifying the verse, but puts it in brackets. So you're coming along, you read verse 3, and then all of a sudden you, you see a bracketed number 4, but there's no words within the text. It provides a footnote that you then have to read. You can see where the verse is supposed to be by a bracket, bracketed number, but it has a footnote that includes the quote and says that some manuscripts include this, holy or in part. The ESV provides a footnote at the end of verse 3, which says some manuscripts insert wholly or in part, and then provides the terminology. So this is one instance where uh, some English translations provide this content and others don't, just like the previous two examples that we've looked at. What's going on here with John chapter 5 and verse 4, though, or verse 3 and 4 for that matter? The verse, the passage, the words that appear in the New King James Version are not found in the manuscripts of the earliest and best manuscripts available to us. Particularly, you, if you can remember the, some of the manuscripts we've talked about, you won't find this in Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, or Codex Bizet. It is present in Codex Alexandrinus and about another 20 manuscripts, some of which will put an asterisk or some other symbol next to this passage, which was an indication that the scribe who was copying this text believed these, this section to be suspect. What's interesting is that this one verse, one and a half verse, if you will, it does contain seven words that are never again found in John's writings, and in, some manu and, and in some of the manuscripts which the verse does appear, there are some variations in its wording, and it's, it has a variety of forms to the way it appears. What's interesting is that the verse really repeats information you get from the following verses. So if you finish the story from verse 5, you'll find out that the text does relay the facts that the, the, the sick man complain, well, verse 7, 
is where the sick man complains that he has no one to assist him into the pool when the water is stirred. So you don't need verse 4 to find out about the stirring of the water. That is related in verse 7. And then verse 7 also informs us that when this paralyzed man finally gets into the water, he finds out that someone else has entered before him. And from, from those two pieces of information, you can infer that the water in the pool is stirred and the first person to enter it is healed. You don't need verse 4 to come up with that information. So what uh, scholars believe may have happened is that the further explanation of how this pool healing situation occurred, that an angel was specifically involved in stirring up those waters, that that, that information was, was probably an oral tradition or something that was written in the, the margins of the text of a, of a manuscript as further explanation of what happened here, and that over time, copyists included the non-biblical information in the text. That somehow, some way, a copyist included this information because it was explanatory, but it wasn't original. And so it got added into later manuscripts rather than the earlier manuscripts. And it's probable that this was a marginal comment explaining the moving of the water that we read about in verse 7. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. How many of you like to write in the margins of your Bible? Anybody in here do a lot of writing in the Bible, underlining, highlighting? I don't do that because I'm messy. <laughs> and I don't like my handwriting, and I think it makes my Bible look worse. Now, I like doing notes in an uh, in a online or a, a digital Bible. You can easily type those up and... and they don't make it look unclean in some fashion. But there are a great many people who benefit from putting notes in their Bible. And I bet there are some of you who have had to buy new Bibles so you could start over with notes. Uh, you filled your Bible up with so many marginal notes that you needed a new one to start putting notes in fresh. Now I want you to imagine, imagine that all the Bibles in the world disappeared except for the one with your notes. And somebody comes along that doesn't know what a Bible is supposed to look like. And they come across your Bible for the first time in hundreds of years, and it's got the text all typed out, but it's got all these handwritten notes in it as well. And let's say it's now their job to take this one Bible in their possession and to create new Bibles out of it because there are no other Bibles it's quite likely that they would feel compelled to include some of those notes if they don't know any better. That's likely what happened in a lot of these manuscripts is there were marginal notes on the side of the, of the manuscripts from people who have not necessarily listening to a sermon but, but had oral traditions passed down to them, and that content then gets incorporated into their, uh, their copy because they're wanting to be faithful to the original copy. That is something that there is evidence of happening in other passages particularly, uh, and we're going to come across one of those in the next example, where the, something that was in the margins eventually got brought into the text. And that may have happened even here as an explanatory uh, note was provided in the margins of John chapter 5 of one copy, and over time it got incorporated into the text. But John chapter 5 and verse 4 is one of those examples of a variant um, that uh, is not found in the earliest and best copies of Greek manuscripts. Now we come to the what I consider to be the most famous textual variant in all of the Bible. And it's the one that appears in John chapter 7, verse 53, through John chapter 8, verse 11. We would refer to it as the story of the woman caught in adultery. In scholarly circles, it's often referred to as the pericope adultery. And it's this story that we find so phenomenal because Jesus 
demonstrates such powerful forgiveness in this story. Uh, Let's read it very quickly. John chapter 7, beginning in verse 53. Every English translation does retain it in the text. And I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now, as you read that text, I'm certain you noticed how your English translation dealt with it. If you're reading the King James Version, it makes no qualifications. It doesn't indicate anything is suspicious about this particular passage. If you're reading the New King James Version, there is going to be a footnote at John chapter 7 and verse 53, which is the only verse of this whole passage that's not in John chapter 8. But there'll be a footnote there that says, in you, capital N, capital U, we're going to explain that again in just a moment, in you brackets 753 through 811 as not in the original text. They are present in over 900 manuscripts of John. So the New King James Version is letting you know that the critical text of the New Testament, we'll talk about that in a moment, that's what NU stands for, the critical text puts brackets around this, indicating that's not part of the original text, but then it says there are over 900 manuscripts of John, that's its way of appealing to what we know as the majority text, that there are 900 manuscripts of John that do include it, and once you know that there's a lot of evidence for it. Now the New American Standard Version places single or double brackets around John chapter 7, verse 53 through 8, 11. The 1995 and earlier edition uh, put single brackets. The more recent updated NASB has double brackets. They also include a footnote that says later manuscripts add the story of the adulterous woman, numbering it as John chapter 7, verse 53 through 8, 11. The ESV has a bracketed heading prior to John chapter 7, verse 53. And it says in the heading... The earliest manuscripts do not include this passage. Additionally, the ESV places double brackets around the entire text of John chapter 7, verse 53 through 811, and it includes a footnote indicating that some manuscripts do not include this, and others add the passage here or in other locations. Now, the NIV takes the boldest measures. The NIV inserts a line before, a solid line before and after this passage. It also includes a bracketed heading prior to chapter 7, verse 53, that says the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have this. And a few verses, or excuse me, a few manuscripts include these verses wholly or in part, and then it lists some other places where it's included. Now that's the most fascinating thing about this story, is that among the manuscripts of the New Testament, it doesn't always appear in John, between John chapter 7 and 8. That's right, chapter 7. <laughs> it doesn't always appear in this same location. Here's what's fascinating. Some manuscripts place the story in John chapter 7 after verse 44. Other manuscripts place it after chapter 7, verse 36. That's immediately before the mention of the last day of the Feast of Booths, when Jesus spoke about rivers of living water. Other manuscripts place it at the very end of John's Gospel, after verse 25 of John, chapter 21. 
as if they didn't know where to put it into John's gospel. They just knew it went with John's gospel. But what's even more fascinating is that sometimes this story is put in manuscripts after Luke chapter 21, verse 38. That is the last verse of Luke chapter 21, and that puts the story immediately before we have the last week of Jesus' life told. So you have this interesting story located at four different places in the book of John and one place in the book of Luke among the different manuscripts that we possess. That doesn't happen with, much, with very much in the text of Scripture that a, the story jumps Gospels sometimes. And here's the thing. This story is lacking in the best Greek manuscripts. Papyrus 66, which is one of the Bodmir papyri that we've looked at before, it's a, it's a near-complete codex of the Gospel of John that dates to about 200 A.D. It doesn't have this story. Papyrus 75, another one of the Bodmir papyri that we looked at, that contains most of Luke from chapter 3 through chapter 24 and the first 15 chapters of John, it dates to about 175 to 225 A.D., and it doesn't have this story. Codex Vaticanus doesn't have this story. Codex Vaticanus dates to the early 300s A.D., as does Codex Sinaiticus, which also doesn't have this story. And Codex Washingtonius, me and Ben have been working on the pronunciation of this. Washingtonius is dated to somewhere between 300 and 500 A.D., doesn't have it either. And the pages that would contain this story in both Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Ephraim Rescriptus are missing. But careful calculation by scholars, they can look at what pages are missing and what, what content from the Gospel of John is missing, and they can calculate, calculate out about how, how much of the text is, uh, could be covered on those pages that are missing. And just by that kind of calculation, by, num by uh, uh, measuring the columns and by numbering how many letters can fit on each row and each column, they can determine that on both Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Ephraim Rescriptus, this story would not have fit in the pages that are missing. And so the evidence is stacked against this story. The earliest Greek manuscript known to contain the woman caught in adultery story is Codex Bizet, which dates to about 400 A.D. So there's not strong manuscript evidence for this, this story. Even more significant is the fact that no Greek church father for 1,000 years after Christ refers to this story as belonging to the fourth gospel. And this includes people like Origen and Chrysostom, and Anonis, these guys who wrote material that provided verse-by-verse -verse information about the Gospel of John. The first Greek church father, to use that terminology from the textbooks, the first one to make reference to this passage came from the first part of the 12th century, and when he cited it, he declared that the accurate copies of the Gospel do not contain it. So when you look at the evidence related to this particular story, it bounces around in Scripture among the various manuscripts. It's not provided in the best and earliest manuscripts, and it's not cited by early church fathers. What that tells us is that the woman caught in adultery story probably is not a biblical story story. And its inclusion would probably be best at the end of the Gospel of John, since we don't really know where it belongs, if it's going to be in there. Here's the interesting thing. Is the fact that this story, is, is the fact that this story is not in the best manuscripts evidence that it's not a true story? The fact that it's not in the best manuscripts 
is an indicator that's probably not an original to the Bible story. It may be a true story, though, that was passed down orally by the disciples of Christ and through the church, but that doesn't mean it belongs in the Bible. It may be a story you could still utilize and reference because it's cited, uh, for instance, in the 4th century in an uh, 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 Eusebius indicates that Papias had knowledge of the story, not necessarily knowledge of it in the text of John, but awareness of the story, and Papias lived in the second century. So it may be a story that was orally passed down and could be true, but it's not biblical. It doesn't necessarily belong with the original text of the New Testament. That's the issue. And so this one stands out as one of the most prominent variants that appears in Scripture and more than likely uh, is not original to the text of John. Now let's go over to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8 we have the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. A very powerful story. And I want to read to you from that narrative. I want to begin in verse 36 and go through verse 38, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Again, that's Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now, depending on which translation you read, you may have noticed that verse 37 was missing. Verse 37 is included in the King James Version without qualification. It's included in the New King James Version, but there is a footnote at the beginning of the verse that says, in you, a reference to the critical text of the Greek, omits verse 37. It is found in Western texts. That's a text type, including the Latin tradition. The New American Standard Version from 1995 places single brackets around chapter 8 and verse 37, but keeps it in the text with those brackets. And it also includes a footnote that says early manuscripts do not contain this verse. The updated New American Standard Version provides a footnote which says late manuscripts add verse 37 and then cites it in the footnote. The NIV provides, like it did in uh, John chapter 5 and verse 4, it provides the number 37 to mark where the verse should be in brackets. And then it provides a footnote refer and states that some manuscripts include this content. The ESV provides a footnote at the end of verse 36, which says some manuscripts add all or most of verse 37. So at least in, in every major trans translation, English translation of the Greek New Testament, you'll find a reference to verse 37, at least in the footnotes. Now, what's the issue with this passage? Once again... It's manuscript evidence. It does not appear in manuscripts earlier than the 6th century. However, as early as the late 2nd century, there was a tradition that the eunuch had made this confession. What you have to understand is that the confession the eunuch makes here, the confession, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, was the confession that every Christian made. It was the known confession that you make based on Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It's the confession that you uttered. And so based on the simple tradition of these are the words that you say when you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it may have been supplemented here because that's just what you did. That's just what you said. And so as early as the second century, it was believed that the eunuch made this confession. And we know that these were the very words that were the common confession made at baptism. 
And it's likely that a copyist or a scribe sincerely believed the words belonged in the text and over time included them. But the earliest manuscripts, manuscripts particularly earlier than the 6th century, do not include that phrase uttered by the eunuch. Now, we often appeal to that verse to help people understand what confession they're supposed to make. And if that verse goes away, does that affect our ability to teach people what they need to confess? Or can you go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, and still deduce what it is you have to confess in order to become a child of God? You see, once again, this is an example of a text that we don't want to lose, that we don't want to say doesn't belong, but it does not negatively impact doctrine. You can still find the same doctrine it promotes elsewhere in the New Testament. And so even in moments like this where there is a textual variant that that may uh, cause us to consider whether or not a, a passage should remain in the text of Scripture, it doesn't interfere with the overall teachings of Scripture. It doesn't negatively impact doctrine. Now, the last notable variant I want to draw your attention to appears in 1 John chapter 5, and it affects verse 7 and 8 in particular. What I'd like to do is read 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, using the New King James Version. So 1 John chapter 5, we'll read verses 6 through 8, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Now, depending on which translation you read, you may have noticed that the bulk of verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8 are missing. Now, the King James Version includes all of that without qualification. The New King James Version includes those words in the text, the words of verse 7 and 8 in the text, but provides a footnote that states that the critical text, in you and the majority text omit the words from from the words in heaven to the words on earth. And only, it also says this in the footnote of the New King James, only four or five very late manuscripts contain these words in Greek. Now the New American Standard provides a footnote at the beginning of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 8, which says a few late manuscripts add and then provides the words. The NIV provides a footnote at the beginning of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 8 that says late manuscripts of the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, provide these words. And then in parentheses, the NIV adds that they are not, this terminology, this, these verses, are not found in any Greek manuscript before the 14th century. And interestingly, if you read from the ESV, the ESV doesn't even acknowledge the existence of these words. There's no footnote, there's no reference, there's nothing. Now the issue with this passage is often referred to as the Johannine comma. And it makes this reference to the Godhead. It makes this reference to heavenly witnesses which are distinguished from earthly witnesses. And if you paid attention to the footnotes that I mentioned, you'll find out that there are only a handful, legitimately handful of manuscripts, less than 10 manuscripts, that include those words. And they're all very late. Nothing earlier than the 14th century. Nothing earlier than the 1300s that makes reference to the heavenly witnesses of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Minuscule 61, also known as Codex Monfortianus. Uh, it's, the, it's a Greek manuscript discovered in 
in the 1500s that cited by the first well-known publisher of the Greek New Testament. It's the first manuscript to come to light that has a reference to this passage. It's believed that this edition originated as one of those marginal notes that I've been referring to tonight. And it was added to certain Latin manuscripts during the 4th century, which eventually got incorporated into the Latin Vulgate, which is the Latin translation of the Greek New Testament. See, this passage started in Latin and then got moved over into really late Greek manuscripts. See, what happened, I'm about to give you some, a little bit of history on the, uh, the Greek New Testament and its pro- public publication. The first guy to publish the Greek New Testament in a written form was a guy named Erasmus. His first publication came out in 1516. And some critics of his publication of the Greek text believe that he downplayed the Trinity. And so in around 1520, somebody handed him this codex that included this terminology. It's the only one at that time that even had this terminology. And so when he did his updated edition of the Greek New Testament, he at least made reference to this, these terms that appear in 1 John chapter 5. He made reference to them at the least so that he could acknowledge that a manuscript existed. And it's believed by scholars that somebody fabricated that manuscript to get this information in it so that Erasmus would have to edit his Greek New Testament to include language favorable to the Trinity. Now, once again, we're dealing with a passage that does address a theological concept. But can you get an idea that there is such a thing as a Godhead without this verse? Absolutely. Just look at the baptism of Jesus. You have three representatives present. God speaking, the Spirit descending, and the Son emerging from the water. This, the doctrine of the Godhead is not based solely on this verse. And so you even have a modern English translation, the ESV, that won't even acknowledge the existence of these words in manuscripts because they are in four or five total manuscripts that are no earlier than the 14th century. So you have, this is one of the most problematic passages, I would say, of the New Testament. But like I've said all along, none of these variants hinders our understanding of doctrine or theology. None of them infringe upon it. If you removed all of these passages from the text of Scripture, it wouldn't change Scripture in the sense of the overall message and our ability to understand what God's will is. But let me now transition away from these specific variants and make sure you understand a few important terms that have been present at times during this study so far that relate to the manuscripts themselves. The first term I want to uh, mention is the textus receptus. Now, we haven't said this yet. We haven't mentioned this yet. But the textus receptus, or received text, is the term for all editions of the Greek New Testament from 1516 when Erasmus published his first edition through about 1633 when a guy named Abraham Elzevier published his. They were the basis of the Greek text for a century. But they were only utilizing a handful of manuscripts that were relatively late. And when Abraham Eliezer uh, printed his, I don't remember what edition it was because he did, I think, seven. When he, predi- he, when he published one edition, he had a preface to his Greek, te- Greek New Testament text. And in that preface, he said, this is the text, the Greek text received by all. 
And that little statement that was written in the preface of his Greek New Testament launched this terminology of the textus receptus, the received text. It was the belief that this was, in the 1500s and 1600s, the text they had to work from was the text received, passed down from the original Greek. The only problem was that the text they had wasn't the best text. The Greek text that they had in their possession at that time was of primarily from late manuscripts. The, the earliest manuscript they had in their possession would have been Codex Bizet, which came from uh, the, around 500 A.D. And Codex Bizet is not of the Alexandrian text type. It is of the Byzantine text type, which the majority of manuscripts fall under. And that's why here's an... Also notice this, the Textus Receptus was the basis for the King James Version of the Bible. The King James Version of the Bible was utilizing what few Greek manuscripts existed in the 1600s, which were rather late and were of the Byzantine text type and associated with the Textus Receptus. So sometimes you might hear people say that the King James Version, also known as the Authorized Version, because it was authorized by the king, that the King James Version is associated with the Textus Receptus because that's the Greek basis of it. But sometimes you'll also hear a reference to the majority text. Now, I mentioned this several weeks ago. The majority text is, is the term used for the Greek text that's present in the majority of manuscripts. Now, the majority of manuscripts are late, and the majority of manuscripts are of the Byzantine text type. That's essentially the same text that the Textus Receptus was based on. But sometimes you'll see in your footnotes, specifically of the New King James Version, you'll see the letter M stand by itself in those footnotes. That's a reference to the majority text. Or you may see M-text. That's another uh, shortened way of referring to it. The majority text just simply means the majority of manuscripts. And then you have a third type of text, more prominent today than it used to be, called critical text. The critical text is the term for the Greek text that is drawn from the best New Testament manuscripts, which are typically associated with the Alexandrian text type. And when you come across the initials NU, that is a reference to the accepted critical text today. NU are initials derived from two different groups that developed a critical text of the New Testament. So you'll see NU in the footnotes a lot. The N in NU comes from Nestle Alland. Those are the last names of two of the more prominent scholars who were involved in developing the critical text of the New Testament. Ebhard Nessel and Kurt Alland. They were the most influential editors of the current Novum Testamentum Gris, the Greek New Testament. That's the accepted Greek text of the New Testament used by all English translations now. And it's in its 28th edition. Its first edition was in the late 1800s. It's now in its 28th edition. So sometimes when they're referring to the Nestle Allen critical text of the Greek, they'll say NA28. So the N in NU comes from Nestle Allen's critical text of the Greek. The U comes from UBS, United Bible Societies. It's an organization of various Bible societies around the world that uh, seeks to um, translate the Bible into uh, languages that everyone can understand. So if there's a, if there's a ling language out there in the world that doesn't have the Bible, the United Bible Society wants to try to translate it into their language so they can read it. The UBS has been putting out a critical edition of the New Testament since the 60s. Uh, it's a, they've been, they, they started publishing their own text of the New Testament in the 60s. Kurt Allen from the previous initials in A was one of the original board members of the United Bible Society and contributed to the development of that Greek text. UBS is now in its fifth edition of a critical text, and it's identical to the Nestle Allen 28th edition. So two different organizations, essentially, set about developing a critical New Testament text based on the best manuscripts, and they now have the exact same text 
And what happens with a critical text is it puts in the text of Scripture what needs to be there, but it also has what's called a critical apparatus that identifies every variant in footnotes and other symbols throughout the text of the New Testament. But, it's, but, it, hi, so, but it highlights what the uh, agreed-upon original text is of the New Testament based on the best manuscripts and then offers the variants in other forms. So if you see in you, that's the critical text. And it's based on Nessel Olland and United Bible Society. So if you come across those initials in your Bible, you'll see them in the footnotes. That's what it's referring to. Now I want to show you this as I wrap up this section on manuscripts. This is a timeline that hopefully you can tell starts in 1500 and ends in 2000. And I want to show you how the Greek New Testament text developed over this time period. This is the period of publication. So we, in the 1500s, start having the ability to publish the Greek New Testament for the masses to see. The first Greek New Testament was published in 1516 by Erasmus. I've mentioned that a couple of times. Wow, that's really hard to read. I should have gone with red, uh, white font on that one. But Erasmus published his first edition in 1516. He published, I think, four more over the years from 1516 to 1535. So he published a total of five editions of, his, of the Greek New Testament from 1516 to 1535. Now, he only had a, a, like 10 or so manuscripts to work off of. He didn't have a lot of material to compare when he did this, but he did the best he could. After Erasmus comes a guy named Stephanus. He actually is a French guy named Robert Estine, but he changed his name to Stephanus. He made it a Latin name. Stephanus then began picking up the work of Erasmus and continued publishing uh, editions of the Greek New Testament. He published four editions from 1546 to 1551. Stephanus is also the guy you get to credit for having chapters and verses in your Bible. But he's the one that carried on the work of Erasmus and uh, had four editions of the Greek New Testament in the years of 1546 to 1551. After him is the discovery of Codex Bizet. Codex Bizet is, is uh, brought to light, I should say. It was uh, in private possession before this. But in 1562, Codex Bizet, one of the, the major manuscripts we've looked at in this series, it comes to light. And the guy that picks up the mantle of editing the New Testament, Greek New Testament and publishing it is Theodore Bizet, the one for whom this codex is named. Theodore Bizet takes up the job of publishing the Greek New Testament. He publishes nine editions of the Greek New Testament between 1565 and 1604. Now, these three guys are, are the guys who are putting out the Greek New Testament. And what you need to know is that Erasmus's third edition became the basis for Stephanus' editions. And then Stephanus basically is producing the exact same Greek New Testament as Erasmus did. And then, Eras then Stephanus' editions, particularly his third edition from 1550, becomes the basis of Bizet's editions. And so from Erasmus through Theodore Bizet, you basically have the same Greek text. And then Bizet gets his hands on Codex Bizet. He includes some of the readings from Codex Bizet in his Greek New Testament. And by 18, oh, excuse me, 1588-1589, he's put out another one of his Greek New Testaments, and that Greek New Testament that Theodore Bizet develops becomes the basis of the King James Version. The King James Version uses Theodore Bizet's 1588-1589 edition of the Greek New Testament for their translation into English. After that, a couple, an uncle and a nephew have a publishing um, company. Bonaventure is the name of the uncle. Abraham L.E. Zever is the nephew. They ended up taking up the mantle of Bidzei and continue publishing editions of the Greek New Testament from 1624 through 1787. And they published seven editions during that time. And it's under them, in, 
in their 1633 edition that that received text terminology comes to light. Now, as they start publishing Greek text, there's another major discovery. Codex Alexandrinus actually just comes into the possession of England at that time in 1624, I believe, or 1627. 1627, Codex Alexandrinus, one of the big three codices, comes into the possession of England. They've already put out the King James Version, so it's not going to help there. The first or second edition of uh, Bonaventure and Elzevir, the, their, their first editions of the Greek New Testament have already been put out. So Codex Alexandrinus will be influential as their um, subsequent editions of the Greek New Testament are published. But at this point, their first publication and the King James Version have already been produced. And then during the, uh, the time that they are publishing, another discovery, Codex Ephraim Rescriptus in the 1710s. It was known, but is in the 1710s that somebody realized, oh, that's useful. Then from there, Codex Sinaiticus comes to light in the 1800s, 1844. And you know what happens in 1881? England decides it needs an updated version of the King James. It's called the Revised Version. It's not popular over here. I have never um, accessed one physically. But in 1881, the King James Version, remember, was known as the Authorized Version. In 1881, England produces a new translation, utilizing the discoveries that have happened between 1611 and 1881, to improve the text, and they called it the Revised Version. And then Codex Vaticanus comes to light. Interesting, the Vatican had kept this manuscript tied up for years. They had had it since the 1400s, but they would let people look at it occasionally and, and under very strict conditions. And finally, in uh, 1889 to 1890, they allowed it to be published for the masses to see. And Codex Vaticanus is one of the best manuscripts of the New Testament, dating from the 300s. And so now, by 1900, you have the three most important uh, codexes finally come to light. Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Sinaiticus, and Codex Vaticanus. So, what happens is in 1898, Nestle Holland that N-A terminology that we were using, that N-A acronym that affects the N-U acronym, they introduced their first publication of the New Testament in Greek. It's now in its 28th edition. And what ends up happening after they produce that? You have your first American-based English translation produced, the ASV in 1901. And then from there, Codex Washingtonius is discovered in 1906, and the Chester Beatty Papyrus are discovered in the 1930s, and the Bodmer Papyrus in the 1950s. I show you this chart to give you an idea of how the Greek New Testament text back in the 1500s relied on so little content. So, little manu so few manuscripts and so weak manuscripts. And over the years, archaeological discoveries of other manuscripts have only improved the Greek text. And you know what you've seen in the 1900s? An abundance of English translations. And in 1901, when the ASV came out, you basically had two options of Bibles, the King James and the American Standard. And then you get to the 1950s and 60s, and the floodgates open on Bible production. And now you can just about go, well, you can't go to a Bible bookstore anymore because they all close. But you can just about log into Amazon and see a new uh, translation popping up all the time. Part of the reason that has happened is because of the improvement in the Greek text available to us. Part of the reason that's happened is also because people want to slant the text their direction. I wanted you to see this to get an idea of, of how this manuscript evidence matters. We are now going to leave the manuscript study of this, uh, the manuscript part of this study, and we're going to focus on the New Testament books, how they're canonized. And then from there, we'll get to coming back to this and talking about English translations.
But next week we'll begin studying the canon of Scripture. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we close out tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another night of study, and it is our prayer that uh, we gain from this, particularly uh, a gain in our appreciation for your word and our trust of it. Lord, may we go from here and represent you well in the world around us. Lord, we love you, and it is through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.